I think it's the other half of their legacy that speaks to us more today, mm -hmm. and that is the half of their legacy, not as musicians, but as humanists and activists and people who knew how to make a difference. And they brought the world together, the black world and the Jewish world and lots of aspects of the white world to make change that resonates today in, at a moment when race remains very much the story of America, these three musicians help rewrite the story and help show us that change doesn't have happen in a straight line. It happens through unexpected curves like black ball players and great musicians. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to your library. I'm David Leonard, president of the Boston Public Library, and it is my joy and pleasure and privilege to host and moderate several of these conversations from time to time. Um, we are joined this evening not just by our in-person audience here in Rab Hall in Copley Square, but also by our online um, audience uh, via Zoom. And so we'll have opportunities to have everybody uh, participate uh, in tonight's conversation. Uh, we are presenting tonight in partnership with um, the American Ancestors American Inspiration Series and also with our production partners at the GBH Forum Network. Uh, the program will be recorded and will be available uh, later on on our media channels. Um, this is actually my second conversation with tonight's guest. Um, the first conversation uh, we conducted during the height or the very beginning of the pandemic. And so it's just so re refreshing to have a three-dimensional guest here beside me tonight for, for this conversation. And so um, I also want to um, note that uh, from the library's programming point of view, tonight is part of our um, annual theme, which this year is revolutionary music, music and social change. And so I think that will resonate with the, the topic of the book for those of you who have read it or are just intrigued enough to, um, to read it a bit later on. Uh, this will be uh, a lead up to the 250th anniversary. So this year is revolutionary music, next year revolutionary art, and then the third, the third year for 2026 being revolution um, itself. And so we think that uh, music here is a combination of programs and examples from our collection with our guests that uh, catalyze social change. This is what m music's rich history does. It catalyzes social change, acting as a powerful conduit for dissent, unity, awareness, and cultural influence. And so to, to our guest this evening, um, Larry Tai, uh, probably a stranger to no one who is here, uh, a New York Times bestselling author of books such as Bobby Kennedy and Satchel, as well as Demagogue, which was the topic of our previous conversation. This is your eighth book, Larry, I believe, yes? And so um, he is previously, of course, an award-winning reporter at the Boston Globe, a Neiman Fellow at Harvard University, and now runs the Boston-based Health Coverage Fellowship living on Cape Cod, not too far away. Please welcome Larry Tai. And so, Larry, this is, um, this is an unexpected book for uh, you to have written, I think. Uh, would you tell us a little bit about the backstory of, of how this came to be? So, you're a polite guy. Um, David, and I think the real way that question would be phrased is, what was a tone-deaf, aging, white guy doing writing this book? And the answer is, I wrote this book because uh, it was part of a gift that has never stopped giving to me over the last 20 years. 20 years ago, I wrote a book about the black men who worked on the railroad called Pullman Porters. And from the end of the Civil War until the mid-1960s, these guys were um, not just taking people across country in elegant style, but they were helping give birth to today's black, middle, and professional class. And when I interviewed the Pullman Porters, there were at that time about 40 of them alive. A couple of years later when the book came out, there were 20 of them alive in the country, and today there are zero of them alive. But I made two promises to them. One is that I would write a book about their favorite sports figure that they ever carried on their trains. And that was possibly the most talented baseball pitcher in the history of the world, a guy named Satchel Paige. 
and that happened a few years ago. And then they made me promise that I would write about their three favorite all-time passengers, and those were three guys named Ellington, Armstrong, and Basie. And the reason the Pullman Porters cared about these guys is that in a Jim Crow era, when America was suffering through an incredible period of racism, even if you were the most illustrious black men in America, like Ellington, Armstrong, and Basie, any time you went below the Jim Crow line, um, below the Dixie line, you were, if you went into the wrong restaurant or the wrong hotel, you were subject to violence, you were subject to potentially death. And so the only safe way for them to go into the Deep South was when they had the money to rent a private Pullman sleeping car. And if they were going to a place like Atlanta, they would have that car pull off on a sidetrack and they would go and perform their concert and when they got done, they would come back to their Pullman car assured of two things. One is that they would have the best meal that you could ever have in Atlanta, including all the great restaurants there, prepared by the Pullman dining car people. And the other is that they would have a comfortable bed. And they did something in return to these Pullman porters for the sake of their keeping them alive. In, at midnight, when they were done with their concert, in the privacy of their dining car, they would perform an extraordinary concert. And I don't know about you, David, but if I could go back to any moment in American history, it wouldn't be bad to go back and having the Duke Ellington Orchestra in this closed capsule of a railroad car with what must have been astounding acoustics perform a private concert that could last half the night. Amazing. Um, then you actually document this in the book, so we can read a little bit more about that, that journey and the role of the, the Pullman car cars and, and, and trains. Um, but it also, from that, it's, it strikes me that there was a relationship between um, these Pullman workers and the three musicians as well. So they got used to seeing them and, uh, and then would, 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 would basically make the journey as, as pleasant as possible. They did, and there was a relationship. There weren't many black men in that era that had the luxury of traveling across the country. And about the only ones that I know about were the Pullman porters who were seeing the country through their cars, were the Negro League ball players like Satchel Paige who were traveling all around the country and jazz musicians. And they were all buddies and they would all gather at the same corner in Kansas City and other places around the country where they stopped and they would all share stories about all the great things they had done and about where they could stay if they didn't have a private Pullman sleeping car and be alive the next morning. Now, we have a few uh, photographs circling through behind us uh, at the moment. So I know you wanted to share some photographs so we would just get a sense of, of these men and their lives and the people in their lives. So to my uh, left as I'm looking up there is a young Louis Armstrong. And sitting in the chair is his mother who delivered him when she was all of 17 years old. His father disappeared about a day or two after he was born and showed up only when there was some pay reason to show up. And the, that is his sister. And that Louis Armstrong, um, his nickname was Little Louis. And as you can tell from the photo, it was um, partly just a, a joke because he was never Little Louis and he got bigger as he went, as he aged. But that was also not that long after he spent the most momentous 18 months of his life, and the 18 months that I think saved his life. That was when he went to reform school for, on a New Year's Eve, shooting off his stepfather's gun into the air. A detective grabbed the back of his neck, threw him into a paddy wagon, took him to jail. Uh, the next day he went to court, and he was sentenced to a reform school whose very name suggested what it was like. It was the Waif's Home for Negro Boys. And it was what he said later saved his life. He also learned there first how to, to toot a bugle, then how to play a cornet, and ultimately how to play a trumpet. And much like Satchel Paige had said that his seven years in reform school, he traded that for learning how to throw a baseball. Louis Armstrong learned a skill that in the fashion of the time, which was a Booker T. Washington um, dominated era. Booker T. Washington said, 
The way black kids are going to make it in the world is to learn a skill that nobody can take away from them. Nobody took the skill of blowing a trumpet away from Louis Armstrong. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, there, there is, um, I think, uh, no one would question that there's a uniqueness about jazz as a musical genre that, uh, that has great appeal. Um, was this something that you already appreciated? Uh, you mentioned, you referred to yourself as tone deaf, but nonetheless, I think jazz is jazz, and I'm, I'm just interested in your, your journey into this topic. Um, do you know, did you know jazz? Did you learn about it, both? Um... So I had taken, during my Neiman year, an introduction to jazz course and a seminar on Duke Ellington. Um, but I still had to, when I was writing the book, ask my wife the difference between harmony and melody and just about any other basic question. And if you're going in to writing a book and you're going to try to interview a lot of people who are important in that field, I suggest that it is much better to be as ignorant as I was when I was trying to get Wynton Marsalis or John Batiste on the telephone. Had I gotten them on the phone and said, geez, I'm a know-it-all, and I know everything about music, and I just want a few quotes from you, they would have hung up on me. When I said instead, I know nothing, and I would love you to help educate me so I don't embarrass Armstrong, Ellington, Basie, and myself, they took whatever time it took to bring me up to speed. So every day when every journalist goes into work, they generally start the day knowing very little about what they're going to write a story on. And by the end of that day, they're trying to write a story educating people about that topic. So I came by, naturally, my ignorance and my fun in trying to fill in the gaps. I, I'm sure there's, there's, there's humility there that is uh, maybe uh, we need to unpack a little bit. You spoke to, I think, 250 individuals or so to, to interview for this, for this book. That must have been an incredible journey, just to have people share their stories. So it was incredible. This book, the only consistency in the nine books that I've written is that each of them was written when the first people I tried to interview said to me, you should have been here 20 years ago. The Pullman oh. Porters, there would have been 400 instead of 40. Bobby Kennedy, most of his friends and relatives were dead. Um, Joe McCarthy, same thing. And with these jazzmen, everybody started out by saying, you're not going to find anybody. And that to a journalist is a challenge, and there are always people there. And once you find the first person, they, each person you talk to has three others that they send you to. So I'm now writing, I've just started researching a book on the Holocaust, and everybody said to me when I started researching it, nobody's around. No survivors are here telling their stories. And what that just means is that the people in the official world aren't sure where those people are, but every survivor that you find, again, knows three more. And there are always going to be people, unless you're really, really late. And I'm only 20 years late, generally, so. <laughs> um, Duke Ellington, Louis Armstrong, Count Basie. Were, were, were these the three that the porters told you to go for? Were there one or two more that could have made it into the list? So, um, Great question, and smarter jazz people than me would probably argue for lots of other people. But I went out and asked everybody I was interviewing, are these three the ones who belong on the Mount Rushmore of jazz? Mm -hmm. And the answer was, with Ellington and Armstrong, there was no question. And the only question was Count Basie. And I was intrigued by Count Basie because I think while he was not the star that Ellington and Armstrong were, he was the he was the best band leader of the era and maybe of all times. He knew how to sublimate his ego and to bring all of his side men and side women together. And in the end, I became convinced partly that these were the three who belonged there and partly that their story overlapped in exactly the right way to make them the perfect trio for me. They were born within five years of one another at the turn of the last century. They all had incredible success in terms of commercial success and um, became jazz luminaries. And they all did something that you will be able to do in your career, but few of us can, which is they all lasted at the top of their field for a full half century. And that was phenomenal. Amazing. Um, uh, there's, there's a 
couple of reasons Count Basie is the lesser known of, of these three. Would you, would you like to pick up on that and uh, maybe sure. elaborate why? Um, so one reason, the reason that the press didn't give quite the attention to Count Basie was because he was the band leader and he wasn't. Louis Armstrong blew a trumpet the way nobody could blow a trumpet. Duke Ellington had 6,000 compositions to his name. He could arrange, he could band lead, and he was an extraordinary piano player. Count Basie was a great piano player, but he liked being under the radar. And you and I were talking before the session began, he came by his secrecy naturally. And thanks to the world of genealogists who did me an extraordinary favor with this book, um, I found out the secrecy that Count Basie was raised with. He had a brother who was born out of wedlock, who never lived at home, and who died of malnutrition at age six months that I'm not convinced Count Basie ever really knew anything about. And the rest of the world, in all of his official biographies, this brother has been written out because nobody knew about him. And the only way I found out was not because I was smart enough to find out, but because my genealogical researcher was, and went and looked through the records and realized that this young boy, who was called Samuel Basin instead of Basie, had been farmed out to a fortune teller um, to raise, and he died of malnutrition. It was one of a series of secrets that we now know about that I think created an atmosphere of keeping everything under your hat that permeated everything Basie did in the world. And so anytime a uh, journalist like me would get him pinned in a corner and say, tell me about yourself, he would tell them shockingly little. And I think that was part of who he was and part of, again, the mystique. I knew as little as I knew about music, I knew that Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington were famous personalities and the world knew about them and finding out about the one that was the most enigmatic was really fun. Mm -hmm. There's another dimension where I think, um, and you, uh, there's a chapter that is also has the same, uh, their work as, as ensembles, one's an orchestra, it was, and, and this is part of the character of jazz as well, is that it's always about many voices, many instruments all coming together. So how do they, how do they approach that? Um, uh, you, know, you want to pick one of the characters and tell us the story sure. of that? So the character, um, let's look at um, Duke Ellington. And what Duke Ellington did was he understood the musical skills of every side man and side woman in his band, but he also understood the psychology. He knew that Paul Gonzalez who was an extraordinary um, the musician, was also a drunk and was a drug addict. And he knew that at a certain point, Paul Gonzalez could actually fall off his stool during a performance. So what he would do in trying to get Paul Gonzalez to sober up was he would train him that the more drunk or the more stoned that he was when he came into a concert, the more likely Duke Ellington was to call on him for a solo performance. And if he was too bad, he would fall apart during that solo. So that was about the only thing that got Gonzales, Gonzalez to give up on his vices. He knew everybody else in the band and what their skill was. And when he was writing a composition, you generally write a composition and then you figure anybody can be my sax player or my trombonist. He wrote his compositions for the particular musicians in his band. And he had their parts so fine tuned to who they were that he knew it was gonna work brilliantly. And all of these guys understood the psychology of their co-performers mm -hmm. to the point where they could bring them together. And if you were a side man in a Duke Ellington band, you knew two things. One is you knew that you were gonna become, eventually, if you were good, become famous, because you were there with Duke Ellington, who would take you around the world and would get you enormous publicity. The other you knew that if you helped Duke compose a number, or you composed it yourself, you were not likely to get a whole lot of credit for that composition. And the most famous, anybody here know a particular song that Duke Ellington, that you know Duke Ellington for? What's, what's his most famous song? The Take the A-Train. So Take the A-Train was his most famous composition, but if you heard him play it the way he did at the beginning of every performance that he did, 
About a third of the time he would mention the fact that it wasn't his song. And the other two thirds, everybody thought, that's your theme song, that's Duke's song. It was actually composed by an extraordinary guy who was, uh, who was named Billy Strayhorn and who was on his way from Pittsburgh to Harlem to interview with Duke Ellington. And Duke gave him directions. He said, here's how you get to Harlem. You take the A train. And Strayhorn was so brilliant and so tactical that he realized if he showed up for that interview and had actually composed a song out of the directions that Duke gave him, that he would get the job. He got the job. He became Duke's favorite collaborator. And until he died, he was the guy who was the closest thing to a son and a protege. And I want to just say one last thing about Billy Strayhorn. Billy Strayhorn was known for something else. He was an extraordinary musician, but he was also gay in an era where jazz was one of the most macho of the musical forms. And the idea that, the, the idea that Duke Ellington stood by Billy Strayhorn was something that Martin Luther King didn't do with his protégés who were gay and that very few black leaders at the time would do that. And to me, one of the many things that I loved at the end about Duke Ellington was the courage he had to defy anybody and any stigma that there was in the end. Amazing. Um, I want to turn back to their, each of their early lives. Um, and we, we do want people to read the book, so we're not going to tell all of the stories. <laughs> but um, each born into poverty, each born around either right before the turn of the century or the early part of the century, can you take us through the early phase of you know, growing up in poverty, ultimately being discovered, and then I want to go forward from there. So, so I promise to keep these answers shorter and shorter. And the, um, so very quick stories about Armstrong, Ellington, and Basie. Armstrong grew up in the neighborhood of New Orleans that was so rough and tumble that it was called the battlefield. And the idea that he survived to 13 when he was sent to reform school is a little bit of a miracle. And he just knew the ways of the street. And he was out there peddling um, his music. And he, his most famous nickname was Satchmo. And Satchmo was actually a contraction of Satchel Mouth. And Satchel Mouth is the, um, a reference to the fact when, Duke Elling, when uh, Louis Armstrong, as a young boy, was out performing for pennies, he would store his pennies in his mouth. And he had a very large mouth, which was good for blowing a trumpet and good for storing a lot of pennies. So he comes out of the roughest of the neighborhoods and the toughest in terms of the most Jim Crow surroundings. Duke Ellington was, there's one story in my mind that captures who Duke was as a young boy coming up in Washington, DC. He grew up in a much more bourgeois household. He grew up with a mother who loved playing the piano and who said almost the day that Duke was born, you are blessed, and treated him as if he was this favored child. But when Duke was a kid, he would walk down the big staircase in his house. And he would have young cousins on either side of the staircase. And he would instruct the boys, you will bow to me. And he will instruct the girls, you will curtsy. And he would instruct everybody, applaud, applaud. And he said, you should applaud because someday I'm going to be known as the great Duke Ellington. Wow. Wow. And for the rest of his life, he told a dozen different versions of the story about where he got his nickname. But the truth is, he gave himself the nickname because he thought that he was going to become aristocracy. And he was obviously right. Count Basie grew up in Red Bank, New Jersey, which is a place, anybody here ever been to Red Bank? Great, so four people. Um, I recommend that nobody else bother to go to Red Bank when you're in New York. Um, it was not much of a uh, suburb of New York um, at the time that Count Basie grew up there. It is now a little bit more of uh, an interesting place, but not much. And it's more interesting in part because it's got this great Count Basie cultural center in the middle of town. And Count Basie's aspiration from the age he could actually articulate an aspiration was to get the heck out of Red Bank. Mm -hmm. And he envisioned doing that by joining the circus. And he quickly discovered that he didn't know anything about the circus, but he did know something about tickling the ivories. And he did that well enough in the suburbs of Red Bank that he ended up getting a job at the feet of the great Fats Waller. And he never went back to Red Bank 
uh, except to visit his mother. He certainly never went back to visit his father, who he didn't have much use for. And he got away and escaped, and that was it. I mean, so this then happens early part of the 20th century, these, these three emerging individuals, along with several others. Um, the backdrop of what's happening in, in America um, really goes from Civil War era through the Jim Crow era. And so how in this context are these three individuals discovered and then ultimately celebrated? And that's a mixed story in terms of being appreciated because there's a lot of the music reviewers who have ex explicit, if not implicit, racist biases that are coming out, and yet they still, they still manage to emerge. So they were discovered and given rave reviews at the beginning, not in America, but when they went overseas. When they went to England, when they went to Paris, the foreign reviewers, um, not that they weren't racist, but they were more open to the fact that these guys were in fact musical geniuses. And it took them a long time, and they went through hell to finally get recognition. Count Basie started at a dive in Kansas City called the Reno Club. Um, it gave, uh, it was probably nicer than any dive when you think of the word dive, um, but not a whole lot. And he had a microphone in that Reno Club that broadcast the performance. I don't know how the heck they got it there, but it broadcast the performance all across America. And a guy named John Hammond, one of the um, great musical promoters, was driving through Central Park and heard on the radio Count Basie in this dive bar, the Reno Club, got on a plane the next day, went to Kansas City, signed him up, and as quick as he could, Count Basie left Kansas City and his career took off. The other two had almost equally miraculous beginnings, but they were doing this, they were fighting against two things, one or three things. One is that jazz was a new form of music right. and not quite accepted. The second was that nobody knew who they were, and the third was their skin was black. And it meant that even um, later on, they, for almost all their careers, when they went to a place like uh, Las Vegas and performed at a casino, they would be the star at the casino and they would have to go in through the kitchen. That there were, it was only Frank Sinatra who said at one point he had a bodyguard on Count Basie when he went to Las Vegas and he said, if anybody says anything to you, my bodyguard will take care of them. And nobody, everybody in Las Vegas knew enough when Frank Sinatra said something like that, that um, you didn't mess around. But they had indignities tossed at them their entire careers. And the idea that they had the fortitude to overcome those was amazing. And, but presumably before that, there was broader recognition and appreciation within the black community, within um, black music clubs. Um, and so it was really about how does it be go, whatever counted as mainstream exactly. uh, versus so within a local community. Great question and it went in stages. They were all three initially um, playing for black audiences and then they all three broke through in some way um, to play for initially what were called uh, black and tan clubs which were mixed race audiences and then especially um, Armstrong played mainly in his later career to all white audiences because that was where more money was. And that happened slowly. And it was like what was going on in the Negro League baseball fields. When Satchel Paige was pitching a baseball game, the, the reason that Branch Rickey and all the owners of uh, the big league, the major league, all white baseball teams integrated their baseball clubs was not because they suddenly uh, had a, a notion that it was injustice having a Negro Leagues baseball league. It was that white fans and black fans were filling up the stadiums. In Yankee Stadium, when the New York Yankees were out of town, the owners of the team rented the ball field to the black Yankees. And the black Yankees filled up the ballpark the same way the white Yankees did. And so the owners, like Branch Rickey, recognized it was a matter of economics. You could fill, you brought in these great black ball players, and you could have black fans, and you could have all the white fans that had known how great people like Satchel Page were. And that's anyway, sorry to go on. No, and then ultimately, I mean, but then, but then can we not just be in the ballpark together? Yes, exactly. <laughs> so can we not be in the ballpark together? And that 
seemed like it should have been logical, but the good news is when they finally figured out that the sky wouldn't fall if blacks and whites sat together in a jazz club or in a ballpark, that led, according to Martin Luther King, that opened the door to a Supreme Court decision that will celebrate its 70th anniversary in two days. The Brown versus Board decision, King said, grew out of things like jazz players taking the magnificence of their melodies and opening the ears and the souls of white America to black artistry and black humanity. The, the power of music, the power of art, is sometimes to create a safer space for people to be together and be in dialogue through this medium um, than having overt political conversation. Um, run, run with that, um, so Larry, if you that would. Worked. What happened was, and I wasn't there and I can't you know, um, tell you a specific instance, but what happened, I think, is that racist white men who would never have let a black cross their threshold wooed their sweethearts with the music of Duke Ellington and Louis Armstrong. Racist white women who would have walked to the other side of the street if a black man walked towards them in the privacy of their own living rooms click their heels together to Count Basie's toe-tapping music. And I think that rather than saying this is what you ought to do, you just show how these were geniuses and anybody is gonna figure out that, geez, these are black men and they're geniuses, maybe we ought to let them into our schoolhouse or let them use the water fountain or whatever it was. And they um, you, you mentioned earlier uh, Duke Ellington's support for one of his gay friends uh, in, in, the, in this uh, space. Um, there's a, there are moments throughout the 20th century where um, different people who are oppressed for different reasons end up having more, uh, more in common than, than they do not. Um, in, in one of our prep sessions, you talked a little bit about the Black Jewish Alliance of the last um, century. I just wonder if you'd unpack that a little bit for us and, and, and its relationship to this topic. So given the often fraught relationship today between blacks and Jews, it is difficult to remember that in the last century there was this extraordinary alliance. An alliance built on the fact that blacks and Jews liked telling stories in the same way. An alliance built on the fact that they were both outsiders. And an alliance built on the fact that among the two groups in America that probably had the highest concentration of people at the top of the jazz field were blacks and Jews. And it is no accident that Louis Armstrong, Count Basie, and Duke Ellington all had Jewish managers. It is no accident mm. that they all had Jewish bandmates, and it is no accident that they all had Jewish mobsters who were protecting them from Dutch Schultz to Meyer Lansky. And there was this extraordinary alliance, and it was the epitomized by nobody better than Louis Armstrong. When Louis Armstrong was growing up, we talked about the fact that his mother was 17 years old. That is, by the way, one of the only pictures of Count Basie's mother. And, the, um, and I'm not sure we had permission to use it in the book, but nobody could figure out who the photographer was, so everybody decided that meant permission. But the, so Count, uh, Louis Armstrong's mother was 17, and she was out earning a living. She was at times earning a living through prostitution because that was the only thing she could do. And she wasn't around a whole lot. And his father was never around. And so what he would do, we talked about the fact that he was in the street blowing a horn. Well, where he would blow a horn, he was hired to blow a horn in what was known as a rag wagon. A family named Karnofsky, Eastern European and Jewish, did what Jewish uh, immigrants did all across America. They sold anything that they could to make a living. And it was often rags, and it was in Yiddish. I, I said the other day it was shmati, and it was somebody wonderful corrected me and said, no, it's shmata, and the, but it was a rag wagon. And they decided that the way to call attention to their rag wagon was not just to go through the streets and say, hey, I'm selling rags. It was to have a young man named Louis Armstrong give him a tin horn and have him blow a tune on that rag wagon that made everybody pay attention. And it may not have made everybody buy rags, but they sure as heck knew. It was like the ice cream truck that goes through today and rings a bell. 
only much more melodic. And the, he became so attached to this family, he would go home at night, they would cook him an extraordinary dinner of all these Eastern European Jewish delicacies. Um, Mrs. Karnofsky would sing Jewish lullabies. And he paid tribute to that family by the rest of his life for wearing around his neck a Star of David. And when he wrote the third of his memoirs, it was titled, To the Jewish Family in New Orleans. And it was just, this family had given him a shot when nobody else would, and he became intrigued by them and by a whole Jewish culture. Uh, it, it truly is fascinating to hear um, uh, an author just discover these little threads that would, would not otherwise really come, come to light. So, so thank you for sharing these stories. Be because it's an important sidebar in the book, mm. um, I want to call attention to, there were women in this space as well doing incredible work. So um, could you just spend a moment um, highlighting a little bit of, of that? Sure. So um, I was looking hard, um, partly for commercial reasons, but more for artistic reasons, to find a woman who fit in this same mode, and so it wasn't just jazz men. Um, and I discovered a couple things. One, I discovered that, as you all know, whether you're on a Mac or a PC, if you type in a word and you get the spelling or the contraction wrong, it will auto-correct for you. Try typing in the words jazz men and jazz women, and you will discover that there is a word in Webster's dictionary, jazz men, and that there is no word for jazz women. And that is, I don't know whether that was a mirror or it helped influence, but the jazz women of that era, the only jazz women we know of from that era were vocalists. Bessie Smith, Billie Holiday, um, the, there were wonderful jazz women, but those jazz women were, even in their roles as vocalists, were stigmatized. They were called thrushes and warblers and canaries, and they faced the double stigma of being black and being a woman. Trying to be a jazz instrumentalist as a woman was a whole lot harder, and trying to be a woman band leader was almost impossible. And the only woman who made it anywhere in the jazz world at that time, who was a composer, an arranger, an extraordinary piano player, and a band leader, was a woman whose first two names don't give you a clue why she made it to that level. They were Lillian Harden, but her last name was Armstrong. And she was Louis's second wife. And she was the one who recognized his genius before anybody else did. She helped his career hit sky high. And he, at that point, divorced her and didn't do anything for her career. And yet, on her own, she made it to the top of the field. Mm. Um, Boston has had, at many points in its history, vibrant music scene, uh, including many jazz clubs. I'm just wondering if you could connect our, our, three, uh, our three leaders, our three amazing musicians to, to the local geography. So they loved coming here. They loved coming here partly because there was a club run by the, um, one of the titans in the jazz world, a guy named George Ween, who started the Newport Jazz Festival, who started the New Orleans Jazz Festival, who was a Jewish kid from Newton who married a black woman in an era when that was incredibly difficult for both of them. And he ran a club in Boston called Storyville. And it was one of the sainted jazz clubs anywhere in America. And they all love coming here, partly because they love George Ween, they love Storyville, they love performing on the rare occasions when they did at Symphony Hall. And what they really loved doing was in the middle of deadly hot summers in New York, was getting away to Boston, and then either going to Cape Cod or places like Salisbury Beach and Old Orchard Beach. And getting out of New York the same way anybody who could afford to did was what they loved doing during the summers. Yeah. Um, thank you. Let's, let's open uh, up the conversation, as I promised, to, to our audience. And we'll take a, a couple of questions. Um, I, I do have some from, from the registration time that I can ask as well. And uh, you know, I, I I do think we can. We, we're doing. An, you've done amazing justice to these men, um, but I will also recognition of it's two white guys up here having a conversation about these incredible black um, black black artists. And so there's a limit to how far we can go, um, but we'll invite the audience in to help us out a little bit with that. 
I've read that uh, Duke Ellington's father was a butler in the White House. Is that correct? Um, so he was, but he was a part-time. Um, he worked as everything um, from a blueprint guy in a um, Navy facility in Washington. He did what most black men did in that era, which was cobble together three jobs. And the one that everybody reported on because, I mean, who was not going to report on the fact that he was a butler in the White House? And that was a dramatic thing, but that was a very part-time thing. But what Duke learned early on was extraordinary table manners because his father was a butler in the White House. And he had come back with not just leftover food from that time, but a sense of what proper etiquette was. And, um, one more way that Duke was destined to be aristocracy. One other thing. Um, I'm, I'm a student of uh, the history of jazz because I'm a musician. Uh, what do you three, play? Pardon? What do you play? I play saxophone. Oh, so uh, there are three guys in Duke's band, all from Boston, who, who uh, was a part of the, uh, the personality of the band. Do you, you know those three guys I'm talking about? So tell me which three you're talking about. Okay, uh, Harry Carney, uh, Johnny Hodges, and mm -hmm. Cat Anderson. Cat Anderson, I think, was a, not a, a native Bostonian, but he was a trumpet. He was a high note guy. But uh, uh, Johnny Hodges is from uh, Cambridgeport, and they they always talk about making you know making something for him, like a street name for him. And Harry Carney uh, went well. He was you know the baritone player for all of, almost most of uh, Duke's career. And he was from the South End, and so was, uh, I think, Cat Anderson lived there too. I just know that, and because- uh, So Harry Carney was also, in addition to being a Bostonian, and in addition to being an extraordinary musician, he was Duke's, everybody um, who was a band leader needed somebody that they could trust to really keep their ear to the ground on what was going on in the band. And Duke drove, when the band was riding the bus, um, in the early days, Duke drove everywhere with Harry Carney. And Harry Carney was um, his alter ego. He loved Harry Carney because if Duke was not in a talkative mood, Harry Carney wouldn't say a word to him on a 500 mile trip across country. And if Duke wanted to talk, he would. Harry Carney did everything that Duke didn't like doing in keeping people together in the band. And the, um, he was an extraordinary guy. But Duke. We have a question about Lawrence Welk and the interaction with these gentlemen. I mean, people were watching Lawrence Welk on TV, and, and were they, did Duke appear there? Um, can you give us any history about interaction between those gentlemen? So what I can tell you is um, that I know for sure that there were at least four people who loved Lawrence Welk. Obviously, he lasted a long time, and there are a lot more than four people. One was my grandmother, and the other were Ellington, Armstrong, and Basie. And they had, I always thought of Lawrence Welk growing up as being um, the most vanilla of music and just having, other than playing every New Year's Eve and watching them um, there, that I un couldn't understand what people loved about him. But again, I had a tin ear. Ellington, Armstrong, and Basie said the most extraordinary things about Lawrence Welk. And, the, um, and I started looking at him and listening to him with new eyes and ears after hearing what they said. There must be something about grandmothers. My grandmother in Ireland like, would always talk about how wonderful listening to Ellington and, and Armstrong was. Ah, nice. Um, was, so this international dimension, it's real. It I, can, I can testify to it. Well, Margaret, there's a question right behind you. Would you mind um, sharing the microphone? There. When you describe Louis Armstrong's difficult family life and sort of unavailability of his parents, what was his psychological makeup? Was he able to have intimate relationships? Was he a self-confident person? How would you describe him? So the question about, so I, I would describe him as extraordinarily well-adjusted and he was an amazing guy and his mother wasn't around as much as he would have liked, but she was an amazing mother, he adored her, she adored him, and I think she gave him not a whole lot of money, but an incredible sense of self-worth. Um, but in terms of having relationships, that's something the three guys all shared, and none of them knew how to be faithful. They all had, were men of faith, they believed in God, they prayed before every meal, they all read the Bible, Duke Ellington swore that he read the Bible cover to cover three times, but I knew at least five commandments that they broke 
incredibly <laughs> regularly. And the one about being faithful, um, Louis Armstrong was married four times, and even on the fourth marriage, which lasted from, uh, for probably 30 years, he was famously unfaithful to his wife, and she knew that. And there's a woman who just wrote a book saying that she is uh, Louis Armstrong's illegitimate daughter at the time that he was married to the fourth wife. Now, everybody that I know says that Louis Armstrong tried so hard with all four wives to have children that the idea that he could father a daughter is inconceivable. But who knows, I can't tell that young woman that she was wrong. Um, Louis Armstrong's wife, the fourth wife, insisted that there was no way in the world that that was his daughter. But they, they all were unfaithful. And the most interesting version of unfaithful was Duke Ellington, who stayed married to his wife his entire life. But he stayed married to her even though he stopped living with her and stopped, they stopped acting as husband and wife after about three years. And he stayed with her for a very strategic reason, which was he had a notorious number of mistresses. And the best excuse when a mistress would say, marry me, he would say, I'm already married. And I did a tour. I did a truly wonderful tour of Harlem. And my tour guide was uh, Duke Ellington's granddaughter, who is now 85, named Mercedes Ellington. And we looked at every place that Duke had played. We stopped at every place that he had lived. The longest part of the tour, by far, was every place that he had stashed a mistress. <laughs> we ended up at this amazing cemetery called Woodlawn in the Bronx. And Duke Ellington is buried next to the mother he loved, next to his favorite mistress, several people away from the father he didn't adore, across the street from Miles Davis, and down the hill from just about every great jazz sideman wow. in American history. And I'm convinced if we would all go visit there at midnight, an extraordinary jam session probably goes on every night at midnight with all of these musicians. That brings us to the question of how many descendants are there of uh, the other two, if not um, yes. one, one of so, them. Louis Armstrong, there are no descendants. He had a, an adopted son who was really his nephew, who he promised a young cousin who died in childbirth that he would take care of her son, and he did that. Only something tragic happened early on in that caretaking was the young boy named Clarence fell off the porch and onto his head. And he survived it, but he survived it with mental disabilities. And Duke took care of this kid for the rest of his life. And he was um, tuned in enough, Clarence was, to know that he had this relationship with Louis Armstrong and everybody living within a five mile radius of him knew that he had this relationship and it was the proudest thing in his life. Count Basie had one daughter and she was born with a whole series of disabilities that at the time weren't diagnosed but later on were diagnosed as mental and physical. But the Basies wouldn't accept the limitations that everybody at the time said. They said she should be institutionalized and she will never talk, she will never walk, she will never do anything. And they wouldn't accept that. And Catherine Basie taught her how to talk, how to swim, how to the, do all the things that were said that she wouldn't be able to do. And instead of living the five or 10 years that she was predicted to live, she died last year in her 70s. And Count Basie, who was an inveterate gambler, when Count Basie would show up in a town, the first thing he would do is put on his black uh, captain's hat, flag a taxi, and go to the nearest racetrack and proceed to lose money. And the only thing that convinced him to give up gambling and to start saving money was he had this daughter that he knew was going to have to be provided for for the rest of her life. And for the rest of Diane Basie's life, she lived in a beautiful home with round-the-clock care and the best medical attention and daily attention that anybody could ever get. So that was the long-winded answer, but they all had unusual stories. The, um, could you comment on the great Mary Lou Williams? Mm. There are folks online here who want to understand how you picked the women you picked, Larry. So as our wonderful jazz musician in the back would know, um, Mary Lou Williams was one of the greatest singers, and not just a singer, she was one of the greatest composers um, that lived in that era. And she had 
an amazing relationship with Ellington that he hired her to help him with all kinds of songs. She occasionally sang with him, and like everybody in his orbit, he stole from her. And in her memoir, she partly paid great deference to Duke Ellington, and she partly took him to task for not giving her the proper credit. And that was Duke. And the, he made Mary Lou Williams more famous she might, than she might have been otherwise, but she would have been even more famous had he given her proper credit. Um, like did, did they meet? Did they play together early, late? How did that, tell so, us a little bit about that. Great question. I want to um, answer that by saying, I thought naively when you're writing a biography of three people that you would do a third of the work that you would do when you write a biography of any person. And that's how you would you know, fill your time and get it done. And I discovered something shocking, which is logical, uh, that when you write a biography of three people, people who read the book don't care whether it's only one third, they want you to know everything about that person's life. It's so three it was, biographies, right? <laughs> it was exactly three biographies and exactly three times the work, and I ended up with exactly 10,000 pages of notes that I had to somehow put into a 300-page book. And the three of them, I had hoped, would interact enough that it would just be a natural weaving, and they didn't. They recorded together a couple times, but they didn't for a simple reason, that they all loved be on center stage. And center stage wasn't big enough to have Duke Ellington, Louis Armstrong, and Count Basie on at the same time. So the easiest thing to do was never share the spotlight with the other one. And they said great things about one another, but they had big egos and liked to be uh, in charge. Let's go back to Margaret for one more. The, uh, from one of our online uh, viewers, the title of the book is How These Three Musicians Changed America. You mentioned a little about the relationship with Reverend MLK, but can you expand on how they changed America? Yes. So they did it in two ways. One was they were all actively involved in civil rights activities. Um, Duke Ellington participated in student sit-ins. He wrote songs that were black is beautiful songs before anybody had heard the expression black is beautiful. He told the story of black America through his music. Uh, Louis Armstrong, during the most contentious civil rights battle of the 1950s, which was in Little Rock, Arkansas, um, when Orville Faubus, the racist governor of Arkansas, wouldn't protect the black kids who were integrating Central High School, Louis Armstrong called out the governor for being a word that began with M and ended in R and ended up in the newspaper becoming an uneducated plowboy, which was not the word that he had said. He called out Dwight Eisenhower, our war hero president, for being a gutless so-and-so. And he stood up. Count Basie did the same thing. His wife was an active um, the colleague of Martin Luther King's. They did those overt things, but I think they made the real impact on civil rights, and when I said transformed America, by what they did in a more subtle way. And that was what we talked about earlier. Through their genius, they showed that blacks could be geniuses and had artistry. And in the end, the baseball player I wrote about, Satchel Paige, didn't want to be known as a great black baseball player. He wanted to be known as a great baseball player. These three artists didn't want to be great black jazz men. They wanted to be great jazz men, and they were the greatest. And somewhere in the sky where there is a Mount Rushmore of jazz, these three are the leading figures there. And that made a point to the rest of America that if they could produce the kind of music that would make you cry, and that would, they used to say about Count Basie, that if your toes weren't tapping when you were listening to him, that you ought to go to a doctor the next day because something was wrong with you anatomically. And people who could produce that kind of music were worth giving equal rights to. And Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and Jackie Robinson all said, we stood on these three guys' shoulders. I wanted to ask um, about jazz women again. Mm -hmm. And um, if you... <laughs> Have, if, if you look at jazz at Lincoln Center right now, I'm not sure, but I think the whole Lincoln Center jazz band is all male. Maybe there's one woman. And oh, am I wrong? Yes. Oh, sorry. How, uh, how, but not very many. It's, it's, hmm. And I just wondered, it seems to me as though classical music is more integrated <laughs> in terms of the sexes. What is it about jazz that it's not, has not 
at least to my eye, and I defer to you because you probably know way more than I do. Um, so there is a wonderful center on jazz and gender at Berkeley College, and it is led by an extraordinary um, Grammy Award-winning drummer named Terry Lynn Carrington, whose dad was a great jazz musician, and she is, um, if she were here tonight, she would say there are more great jazz women instrumentalists, drummers like her, or in every instrument in the band. I don't know enough about contemporary jazz to be able to tell you what percent are there, but I can tell you that she has all the great numbers, and she says that it's an entirely different world than in the Ellington, Armstrong, and Basie days. And I gotta say, these guys, at the, end of the, at the beginning of the book, they were my heroes. I found out the clay feet they had in lots of ways and a lot of things they did wrong. And at the end of the book, they were even greater heroes because they were more flesh and blood and real to me. Um, but one of the areas that I would critique them on is they did nothing when they could have to have opened their profession up to women. And the idea that these men who went through such suffering of indignity because they were black didn't recognize that they could help lift another stigma of gender. We have some folks here connecting personally with these, uh, with these amazing gentlemen. And I just, no, no comment necessary, but I just wanted to say that uh, somebody online, um, their father drove uh, Louis Armstrong around Trinidad mm -hmm. between 1959 and 1961. And whenever he would go to Trinidad, um, this gentleman's dad would drive him around. Um, and then there's also, uh, there was a, a teacher at the Little Waifs home, a music teacher. And um, that teacher taught a gentleman online and also his brother how to play music and also, um, of course, um, you know, at the Waves home. That was, who was there? That was Basie? Yes. Yeah. So could you tell that person who drove Louis Armstrong around Trinidad that I'm jealous and the idea of getting to spend that kind of time with Louis Armstrong and he would have been the most magnificent passenger because he knew how to schmooze with anybody in the world. Uh, there were women, incredible women, who used a different instrument, namely their voice. Can you comment on the women vocalists that each of the three found the greatest joy in performing with? Yes. So um, Count Basie found the greatest joy performing with Billie, Holiday, with Billie Holiday for two reasons. One is because she was extraordinary, and the other was because I'm convinced he had a really mean crush on her. And the, um, the, if Duke Ellington were asked for his favorite, my guess it would have been Ivy Anderson. She lasted a long time with him, and she was quite amazing. And there's no question that Louis Armstrong, um, the woman that he fell in love with because he was performing with her. We were, we were a year away from the 100th anniversary of the most amazing jazz recordings ever on the planet. And they were called the Hot Fives. And those were the recordings that Louis Armstrong cut in a tiny portable studio inside the Loop in Chicago. And on the piano during those Hot Five recordings was the very hot Lil Armstrong who was at that time just Lil Hardin, and he fell in love with her, he fell in love with her music, he fell in love with her voice, and he just uh, couldn't stay in love for long enough. But the... um, I would like to end with a final question, which is a riff on one we received earlier. And maybe you can give us some closing thoughts, Larry, with, with the answer to this. It's how does the music of Basie, Ellington, and Armstrong, what does it have to say to us and what, how does it remain relevant to today? So I want to, um, that's a great question to end on, and I want to answer it in two ways. One is by partly ducking the answer that I think the, the music says extraordinary things, and I don't have to tell people, you just go and listen to um, a playlist of Ellington, Armstrong, and Basie, and they speak to us today the way they did you know, 50 years ago, but I think it's the other half of their legacy that speaks to us more today, mm -hmm. and that is the half of their legacy, not as musicians, but as humanists and activists and people who knew how to make a difference. And they brought the world together, the black world and the Jewish world and lots of aspects of the white world to make change that resonates today in, at a moment when race remains very much the story of America, 
these three musicians help rewrite the story and help show us that change doesn't have happen in a straight line. It happens through unexpected curves like black ball players and great musicians. And I want to just say that, um, so I'm doing a lot of talks and I've done a lot of talks over the years and there is no better interlocutor than David Leonard who, there aren't many people who actually run librarians who stick around at night to curate uh, readings, and I just think we deserve him. A big round of applause for David. Uh, yeah, not, not necessary and too kind. It is our job to bring books to life that are written by such amazing authors. Um, so please join me in thanking our guest this evening one more time, Larry Tai. Um, we are delighted to have co-hosted this evening. Um, again, we want to thank these two gentlemen on stage for uh, gr great things they did. We want to thank our audience online. We had 500 people register um, to hear this online. So uh, I guess some people wanted to, we're all over the country. So it's really nice to have both audiences. We appreciate you in the room, your interest in history, and we appreciate uh, the good and the bad all the folks, the women, we underserved women, underserved minorities, we are unearthing all of it now, and it's an incredibly exciting time in history to be hearing alternative stories of America. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you.